about your Bibles, uh, go to the Old Testament first today to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. And if you can, step over to Jonah chapter 2 and verse number 9. I must, uh, you might say, well, you're starting out in the Old Testament when we're talking about a New Testament truth about salvation and soteriology. Now, I have made this statement. I'm going to really emphasize it tonight. There's one thing that you can't get wrong, and if you do, it'll affect your whole life. And that is whether you know if you've been saved or not. Amen. And that you got saved the right way. Amen. Now, I'll do a little education just in the class, like some of our workers here that work at the altar. Let me share something to you. Now, a lot of times you'll ask somebody when they come, oh, have you been saved? And a lot of times they'll, they'll use that word and say, yes, I have. But I, I have to be honest with you that you should not stop there. Now, hold a minute. You, you say, what do you mean I shouldn't stop? Don't I take their word for it? Well, what if they're deceived? Yeah. See, I find out where they got saved at. Absolutely. Right. Let's say, for example, I want to help you tonight. This is good. Uh, I didn't even know I was going to say this, but I thought I'd just say it anyway. It'll help my auto workers. It'll help me. Uh, uh, I, I had somebody come one time, and they came to the altar. Those, they said, I asked them, are you, are you saved? They said, yes. And I said, well, where were you saved at? And then they told me that they were saved in an apostolic church, apostolic Pentecostal church. Well, I want you to know something. When they cued that to me, I knew they weren't saved, most likely. Hello. Of course, I know what the apostolic church teaches. Right. They teach they, they, they teach work salvation, number one. But the, and we've, we've dealt with this some in the church. We've had at least two people saved out of uh, some Pentecostal movements that didn't teach salvation right. And by the way, you better get salvation right or you're on your way to hell. And, uh, but anyway, here's what apostolics believe. They, 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 they believe you got to repent, then you got to believe, then you got to be baptized for the remission of sin, and then the evidence of them being saved, that particular group, is that they speak in tongues the moment they walk up, come up out of the water. Well, ladies and gentlemen, y'all with me? But what if you just said, have you ever been saved? Well, the way, way this world looks at salvation, most of our population would say they are saved, whereas most likely about 3% of the population is only saved. Because narrow is the gate, and broad is the way to get destruction. Somebody help me preach. See, this thing, this thing about salvation, it's serious. You can't get this wrong. By the way, you get this wrong, most likely in your life, you'll be unstable. Some of the most unstable people I know are people that are confused about their salvation or hadn't got it right. Or there wasn't a real change in their life. Am I preaching? I want you to know. I want you to know something. You need to know that and need to answer that. That you know that you've been saved. Somebody help me preach. You said, "Well, you know, I didn't know that at the altar. I'll ask some questions." Absolutely. Yeah. Because you may get the right. You, they may have no clue what salvation is, especially if they've been raised in an Armenian church or uh, uh, what if they're a Calvinist that don't live by you. They're just hoping they're one of God's elect. No, they need to know a clear picture Amen. of salvation. Amen. And by the way, if they don't know that, I'm leading them to Christ. I'm not leading them back to Christ. 
I'm just saying, does that make sense? Somebody that nods your head at me or something. Amen. By the way, you need to get it right, but we need to know what is right. What do you think I've been teaching these last five weeks for on soteriology one-on-one? That, uh, and I, I've had some people in the class tell me, you showed me some things I didn't know. Especially, the, the gospel is more than just him dying on the cross. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. He was delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. Much more, we are saved by his life. He could have died 35 times, but if he didn't come from the grave, nothing works. Amen? But, is that helpful? I know one. That, uh, I don't want to get it wrong when I'm presenting it. And if you're there in this room and you don't know for sure you're saved, you need to get saved tonight, and you need to get it right and do it right and know what's right. Amen. Amen. Because all, as I've said the last five weeks, how many of y'all believe there's a lot of confusion about salvation? It's not, it's not grace plus faith plus baptism plus good works plus this plus that. No, no, no. It's by grace through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Right. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, I'm, I'm wild out today. Turn to Ecclesiastes 3 and 14. And I'm going to start here. And I've got about six more. We've given, we've given y'all about 28 truths on Salvation 101, and we're down to the last six tonight. And I asked if you had any questions. You got the, that, that handout. Most of you should have the handout. So what you can do, you can look at the handout. And if you've got any questions, write it down. Make sure you email it because I like, I like to really teach you if you've got any questions at all about this truth of salvation. Amen? Right. Ecclesiastes 3.14. How many of y'all believe the Bible is the Word of God? Amen. How many believe it's inspired, inerrant, infallible? God breathed. The only real authority is not what you think about salvation, what you think about salvation. It's what God says in his book about salvation. Look what, this is a great scripture. Then I'm going to follow up with another Old Testament scripture. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be, what? Forever. Not if I persevere to the end. No, what he does is forever. Listen to this. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Amen? Amen. Now turn to Jonah, Jonah in the Bible, and then we'll move on into the rest of the truths that I want to give you tonight. Jonah in the Bible. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Chapter number two and verse number nine. Now, I haven't. I'll give you a good question. I want, can I give y'all a, it's not a trivial question. It is what you think about this question. Uh, Brother Kerlock, you, you preachers, listen up. Did Jonah die in that well? Okay. Anybody disagree with him? Okay. Everybody agrees with Joe. Huh? (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm not going to preach anything about it. I just thought I'd get your attention with it. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah, it is here or there. <laughs> As Jonah was in the well's belly three days and three nights, right. so must the heart of Son of Man be in hell three, day, or three days and three nights. Right. Or in the heart of the earth, three days and three nights. Right. So, did Jesus die? He did. Was he put in hell? Abraham's bosom? And he came up out of there? Just like Joe. Just like Joe. I just, I just thought I'd share that. I really didn't mean to say all that, but it, I think I, I, I'm learning every day. Now, how many, read, how many heard the verse, whatsoever God does, he does what? How many of y'all believe that? Raise your hand. Now, the question is, what are some of the things God does? Look at Jonah chapter 2 in verse number 9. And this is when Jonah is getting spit up out of that whale's belly. He said, but I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Notice this statement. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Now, let, now let me ask you the question. Is salvation is of the Lord? Y'all believe that? None of us. Then how long are you saved? Forever. It's not a persevering to the end. It's not a holding on or hoping I am God's elect. What if you're not? I mean, how do you know you are? I know how I am God's elect. I know I'm God's elect because I, I have received God's elect son, Christ, and by receiving his elect son, I am the elect. Y'all, am I helping you? See, you can't get this wrong about salvation. It's of God. Now, here's what I believe. Let me simplify it. Before the world began, God thought it. God, he thought it. He had the plan. He, that doesn't mean before the world began, he said, Lois, I'm choosing you to be saved, but I'm choosing your husband to be lost. Or, I'm, I, Randy, I'm choosing you to be saved and Nancy to be lost. That's not what God done. God planned the plan of salvation that his son would come and die. That, that his Holy Spirit would, would work on people's heart and that the gospel would be preached, which is the death, burial, and resurrection. And through the drawing of God and the drawing of his son, you could become a child of God by faith in Christ. Somebody help me preach. I like that. Now, there was two words we brought up last week, wasn't it? that really came out of the blue and they came basically from the Calvinistic movement. And uh, make sure I get pronounce these right. Synergism. Synergism. What is synergism? When it comes to Soteriology 101, synergism is this, that you got to do something to be saved. you got to work to be saved, whether baptism or whether church membership, but you've got to work to be saved. Y'all with me? Yeah. How many of y'all agree with me? That's false. Absolutely. Now, then there's another word, and it's monetism. I'm, I'm close. And what that means is 
that salvation comes from God. Okay? Look at me. Look at me. Now, I believe in that. But the Calvinists don't think I believe that. They would say I'm something like this. They would say I'm either an Armenian or maybe they wouldn't go that far. And I have a problem with this word, but I'll try it. Or a semi plagian Help me, Chad. Plagian. He said, what's semi-plagian? Semi-plagian is that, yes, I believe God planned salvation. It is of God. But they believe me placing faith in God is me helping God and me doing the work. I want you to know that's right out of hell. That's false doctrine. See, God planned it or thought it. Jesus bought it. The Holy Spirit wrought it. And I caught it. And the devil has fought it. Somebody help me now. Now, here's what I believe. I don't believe God chooses you to be saved and you to be lost. I don't believe that for a moment. I don't believe in an effectual call and a general call. I believe in a call of God that comes through hearing of the Word of God and comes through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that will bring a sinner to a place where they can place faith in Christ or they can reject Christ. And when I say that, the Calvinists then say, I'm a semi plagiarist right? Because I'm leaving it up to man. No, God done the whole work. God planned the plan. God's son shed his blood. God's son came from the grave. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. But God in his plan did say you have a free will, and I'll bring you to a place of faith, and you must trust Christ or die and go to hell. Is that pretty? I got that pretty. That's it. And you can get real fancy, Dan, about some of these little words. That, and by the way, this new Calvinist movement, this bunch today that's in the new Calvinist movement, uh, uh, they're, they're wrong. But they believe the same thing the old Calvinists do. They believe in the tulip. They believe in faith, double predestination. Some people are predestined to be saved, and some are predestined to be lost. And that's a lie from the devil. What kind of love's that? God's son died for the whole world. Timothy says, who will have all men to be saved. Here's the thing. God's got a big plan started before the foundation of the world. You're here tonight in time, and it is your responsibility to receive it or reject it. Now, how many is that? Is that all right? I've spent a lot of time. Now, let me give you a few last things. Now, I really want you to listen to this carefully. Nobody, listen carefully, was in Christ before the foundation of the world. Are you with me? Nobody was in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now, he had a purpose corporately for the church, and he had a purpose corporately for Israel, but nobody. Now, listen to this. I, I'll tell you why I say that. Ephesians 2.12 says this, that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
How in the world could I be in Christ if I've never been saved yet? And I was without God. There has to become a time. He doesn't put, hey, he doesn't save you before the foundation of the world. He does not. He saves you the moment you place faith in him. Am I preaching? Boy, I tell you, I will. But this crowd says, it's already done. Every, everything predetermined. And, and some of them even get so radical, they do this. They say, God makes you be saved. And then some of the more radical ones says, God will make you be lost. Now, let me tell you the difference between a hyper-Calvinist and a Calvinist. Look at me. A Cal both of them believe in the five points of Calvinism. They both believe in double predestination. Some people predestined to be saved and some predestined to be lost. The hyper ones are the ones that believe that God causes you to be lost or he makes you lost. Whereas I say we're all lost because of our sin and because of our unbelief. Somebody say amen. amen. That's good preaching. I hope you're getting it. You know, I wish every preacher in America would do what I'm doing tonight. Sinners deserve to hear the truth. How many of y'all agree with me? How many's glad you heard it right? And you got it right. And you don't have no doubts about your salvation. Hey, if you was to die tonight, you know you're saved. Amen. I'm glad I got it right. Amen. Some of you got it right when you were five years old. Some of you got it right when you were 70 years old. But the most important thing is you got it right. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. All right, let me go on. Try to finish. Try is the optimum word here. Free will, or lack thereof, or lack of a type of it, such as libertarianism, is not a proper imperative preconsideration. Scriptural authority is the only, is the one and only concern, irrespective of the implications to man's will. See, I believe everybody has a will. How many believe that? But every word of God is true, pure. He is a shield unto them that put their what? Trust. Trust in him. Proverbs says this, I like this. Had not I had written to thee excellent things in counsel and knowledge that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that sinned unto thee. How, how many, oh, happy day that with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God revealed truth to your life and revealed that you as a sinner and revealed that you were lost and you came by faith and trusted him. Amen. Listen to this. I got this wrote down at the bottom of the notes. I don't know if you can see that on the board or not. We don't start with a philosophy of the will. We start with the assumption that God knows what he's talking about in Scripture. And we let him tell us rather than holding him subject to our philosophy like the Calvinists. What they do, they, they don't, hey, the Armenian and Calvinists, they don't get their beliefs from the Bible. They fit it in the Bible if they can. Yeah. But it's not in the Bible. That, that junk, that false heresy does not come from the Bible. Good preaching. Let's, let's go to the next slide. I, there you go. You might not be able to see it, but let me, let me, let me, let me give you this. I want you, I'm going to share this. Help me, help me with that pronunciation, Chad. I, that word gets me. Plagius. Now, let's look what he believed. He believed man has a libertarian free will, imposed this view on the Scripture, and man has a libertarian free will. 
then uh, Augustine and the Calvinists, man has no libertarian free will, impose this view on the scripture, and man has no libertarian free will. The Bible believer, scripture comes from God. God, how many, how many agree? God cannot lie. Let scripture speak for itself. And faith precedes regeneration. And anyone who thinks otherwise has an authority other than the scripture. I hear these people preach that you've got to be born again. Then you place faith in Christ. Well, born again means you get a divine nature. Born again means you get the Holy Spirit the moment you trust Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, born again comes after faith. I'll say this to you. The moment you place faith, you are regenerated. Amen? Amen. Am I teaching? All right, let me go on. I'm really... If you're here lost tonight, I really want you to listen to this point. Or here maybe a church member, you're not really sure you are saved. And by the way, there are a lot of church people that's going to die and go to hell. Scares me. There's a lot of church people, hey, that are not living the Christian life and and they're not being chastised for doing wrong because they don't have the Holy Ghost in them. That's straight preaching. I know it is. And in this modern liberal world, and by the way, there's a lot of liberal churches believe you can just do whatever you want to do. Yeah. Have at it. But I believe any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Yeah. Now listen carefully to truth 31. Unbelief, you listen, condemns a person not because it is an unforgivable sin, but because it is the exclusion point of access to grace. In other words, the only thing that will keep you from grace is your unbelief. What's the Holy Spirit convict you of? Of your sin? Because you believe on him not. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, you know, that's why a lot of people characterize sin, you know, sin, sin. You know, uh, I know some of these people in the Armenian church, they get lost again. They, get, they only get lost by being bitter and gossip, but they only get lost if they get drunk or gamble or something like that or run out with somebody's wife. Hello. By whom also we have access by what? Faith into this grace wherein we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Listen to this. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 20, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. But listen, be not high-minded, but fear. Hebrews 3, I'm going to give you this too. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Not that you work God's elect. If you die and go to hell tonight, it's just a simple reason. You have rejected the gospel, which is the death, the burial, and resurrection. You say, that's too simple. What's the truth? Hebrews 4, 6 says, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they uh, to whom it was first preached enter not in. Because of what? Unbelief. Oh, we shall get to you tonight. There's folks in this room right now. You know what it takes to be saved. The death, burial, and resurrection, and your faith in it. And I don't know what's holding you up. Is it because you think, uh, you're too wicked. You're not too wicked. You're, the, the sins is not going to take you to hell, but the sin of unbelief is what's going to get you in hell. And you're already condemned right now because you haven't placed faith. 
fuzz in this room tonight, and as much as you heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ, man, I'd get up here and get saved, and I'd trust Christ as my Savior. I mean, why leave with your heart troubled? Why leave with you all upset? All you got to do is place faith in Christ. Amen. Let me give you, I'll give you something maybe you didn't know. Uh, the next slide, please. 32. Armenianism is a branch of Calvinistic thinking. And it is wrong for all the same reasons that the Calvinist is wrong. And believe this or not, Armenian or Arminius was a Calvinist himself before he started the Armenian faith. Hello? He believes in work salvation, but I declare unto you, and a lot of Calvinists get mad at this, they believe in a work salvation. They believe you have to have a lordship, and they believe you've got to persevere to the end to be saved. They don't believe in preservation. I believe, how many of y'all, I believe in preservation. I believe when God saves you, he preserves you, and you're kept by the power of God. Am I preaching? Now, I I believe I am going to finish this week. Number 33, truth 33, the 33rd truth. Israel, and you got to hear this, who is being hardened in Romans 9, the recipients of mercy are identified in Romans 11, 13. Now, let's read. Here's what the Calvinists do. They take Israel's blindness in part and God hardening certain of the Jews to bring out his plan. They totally misinterpret. I believe it's Romans 9, 13, where it says, Jacob I've loved and Esau I've hated. But you got to remember something. That was written 1,500 years later from when they were born. And he was talking about the hatred of the ungodly Edomites. And he wasn't talking about, and here's what the Calvinists do. Jacob I love, Esau I hate. They say, well, God loves some people and he hates others. But he wasn't talking about it. He was talking about Israel. How many of y'all believe we better understand what the Bible says and interpret the Scripture line upon line and precept upon precept? Because you can read over something and think it says one thing when it really doesn't say that at all. Now, let me read these verses. I want you to see this. Look at Romans 9, 31, 32. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, had not attained to the law of righteousness. They couldn't keep the law. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Romans 11, 25, listen to this. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Now listen carefully. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become. Somebody help me preach. Oh, I'm going to stand on this one. (laughs) Y'all look at me. God blinded Israel for a season and cut off a branch and took a wild olive branch and grafted it in. And we would not be saved tonight if it wasn't for God traditionally blinding Israel for a time. Amen. But listen, listen to Romans eleven thirty two, 32. For God hath not concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon how many? Oh. Pretty simple. Yeah. If you interpret it line upon line, and precept or precept. But don't try to fit in some false doctrine when it's talking about a context completely different. Somebody help me preach. I hope you're getting some. How many's learning at least one thing tonight? 
I'm almost done. I, I want, really want you to listen to this. I really want you to listen to this. It, this is real good. The Holy Spirit, boy, this is awesome, is the only member of the Trinity who doesn't draw in the New Testament. Now, we know the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. But look at John 6, 44, famous Calvinist verse. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent the, uh, me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And if you study the scripture, you'll see he's talking uh, about Israel in that whole chapter, chapter 6. But listen to me, who, who did the drawing in 644? Say it. The Father, right? Well, look at John 12, 30 through 32. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now it is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw how many men? All men unto me. Somebody say amen. You know what God's doing tonight? And I, I'm, I'm concluding. And... Uh, you can go ahead and get ready for baptism. Go ahead and step that way. And I'm concluding. God is in this room tonight using his scripture. He's using the Holy Spirit to convict you that you come to a place of faith. Now, I want to finish up with number 35. God's sovereignty and salvation means that he executes it accordance with the scripture and not in accordance with Hindu fatalism. I do not believe in fatalism. I do not believe any white body was born to be lost. Listen to me carefully. If you die and go to hell, it's because you reject Jesus. Now, I'm going to finish. Romans 5, 2 says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, here's it, here it is, Ephesians 1, 13. Everybody look at This is how I got saved, okay? Everybody look. This is how John Smith got saved. Let me ask you, is it how you got saved? In whom you also trusted that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit, I promise. That's how I got it. I heard it. How old were you? Did you hear it? Do you know you heard it? You were so young. Did it make a difference? Yes. Changed your whole life. Wrote all those songs about the blood, all those songs about the resurrection. Well, glory! Yeah. Listen to me tonight. God's sovereign, but he's not going to make you be saved. He's just going to bring you to a place where you can trust God by faith. Bow your head with me. Let me ask you this question. It's me talking to you now. I want every man, woman, boy, and girl to answer this question. If you were to die tonight, if tonight's it, tonight is it, how many of you know that you'd go to heaven, listen, because you trusted Christ by faith and you believed the gospel, the death of the burial and the resurrection, plus nothing, minus nothing. You believe that. How many of you know you go to heaven? Raise your hand. Hold them up. Hold them up. Thank you. How many right now say, Preacher Smith, I'm, I know I wouldn't go to heaven, but I know that he died, and I know he was buried, and I know he rose again. Preacher, I know I'm not saved, but I want to be saved. 
God's been working on me. If, God, if you know God's been working on you, will you just slip your hand up and say, pray for me? If you know he's been working on you. If he's brought some tears in these, your eyes. If, he, if he's convicted your heart. And you want to be saved. You've just been letting everything confuse you and, you. and you've been putting it off. But how many right now say, Preacher Smith, I know I'm not saved, but I need to be saved. Pray for me. Slip it up. And here's what I'm going to do. Those folks here couldn't raise your hand. We're going to stand, and I'm going to let you come right now. Then after the invitation, we'll have baptism. But I want you to come right now and trust him. It's not by feeling. It's by faith. You place faith in the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Stand with me. Our Father, to everybody standing, there's folks here that's been coming for the last several weeks. And Lord, they have in the past raised their hand, some of them, and they're without Christ. Tonight they've heard the simplicity of the gospel one more time. They've heard the truth one more time. And I pray right now that you'll draw them, that they'll have that desire to be saved, that they won't walk out of this room lost tonight. You'll draw them to Christ in Jesus' name.